What are the uh, top three biggest inefficiencies that are currently happening in mapping today? What, what, what inefficiencies, <laughs> things that could be improved on. What are the, th the top three inefficiencies in crisis mapping that can be improved? Top three? Inefficiencies, yeah. In crisis mapping? Yes. Well, I, uh, probably for the Philippines, I can, I can uh, say uh, something. Uh, the first part is uh, there's inavailability of open data. Although there are claims that some government agencies open their data, but really it's not open data. Um, what happens is that there's a claim that it's open data, but if you look at the website, uh, following the definition, the strict definition of open data of bulk access, free for use for everybody, no restrictions, it's not the way it's supposed to be. That's one. The, that's one inefficiency. Because if we don't restrict data, if government agencies in the Philippines just share data, there'll be a lot more products that can be developed. Uh, it may not be produced by the government agencies, it may be produced by the academics, it may be produced by an enthusiast. Nobody can claim uh, sole authority over the production of the best products uh, regarding uh, disasters. And really the best products are the ones that we need for disaster pre prevention and mitigation. We need to put that in the forefront of battle against disasters if we are to be successful in averting hazards. Um, I guess that's a lot already. And uh, if we do that, there'll be a lot that can happen which are not happening now. Uh, I think I mentioned that in my presentation. <coughs> One of the inefficiencies uh, yeah, uh, I would say the area that where we can improve is um, we do have a lot of effort, you know, to create data. Everybody wants to create, you know, um, but I think there is uh, not enough effort to connect data to the problem, you know, to the ground, what is happening on the ground. That's what we observe in the Nepal earthquake. You know, there are different groups, different individuals, different organizations. Everybody is willing to help. Good, fantastic. Mm -hmm. But you know, how can we effectively connect that information? Make make sure that the people on the ground use it. I think that's there is where uh, we need to shift our focus. You know, or I would say that we should make a good balance between the production of the data and the analysis the use. Um, a second one is. Um, um, you know, uh, organizations are also, you know, positioning in a, in a unique way. So the organizational dynamics, different organizations, you know, so uh, the position change uh, over the disaster. You know, they do have their, every organization do have their, their priority, their strategy. Um, so although people say, um, you, know, we want, you know, we want to contribute to disaster, that's, that's good. But um, in some cases, that's also being guided by their the break, own organizational strategy. Um, I would say, um, yeah, these are my um, you know quick uh, comments. Um, well, one other answer that I have was the the part wherein there's no standardized program for the country. I mean, there's a lot of duplication of efforts with the same data and when you, they produce the data is not uh, shared with others they, ju they are just confined in certain pockets or sectors so if we have that standardized program everybody can help everybody can participate but there's no duplication everybody gets to uh, avail of the data that they need Uh, for Luis, yes. Hello. <laughs> it's, it's so exciting to see how this thing is working. I mean, you are doing real change, innovation, saving lives using the experience that we have. I want to ask you, how can the new people that is coming to this world 
to better understand the work that you are doing. I mean, the, how many students do we have here? Raise hand. Students, students. Okay, plenty. Also, I'm, I'm also a student. I want to, I, I uh, has uh, been told the usability is an issue that must be solved. And sometimes that knowledge is too complex. I want to know if you have plans or do you have some lectures or papers or something to do the, to, to get access to that knowledge in an easy way. And for sure, I'm interested to collect those nice learned lessons to, to share with the people in my project. Thank you very much. waiting for orders, but just tell them to make a bunch. Okay. Get ready for the break. You want to first? Well, um, I'm, I'm, I'll answer first. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm a student. You, you start, I can, I can <laughs> add. <laughs> I'm a student as well. Always been a student, will always be a student because there's always something to learn every day. Uh, for what we do, we have a blog. You just have to Google NOAA blog, and you'll find a lot of details about what we're doing there. You can also go to our website and play around with the tools there. Uh, the, the URL is noaa.dost.gov.ph. And if you want to look at more technical details, all of these things that we do in Project NOAA, we try to get it peer-reviewed and published in ISI journals. And we have a site, well, it's actually my site, wherein we put up all of the articles that we publish in ISI journals. Uh, you can just Google Academia Edu, Lagmai, and then you'll find all of the articles about Haiyan, Project NOAA, the use of open street maps for uh, disaster prevention and mitigation, and all sorts of other things, landslides included. So it's just at your fingertips, Google is the, is the key. Yes. Yeah, uh, if, if I may add, um, uh, the first, uh, if um, you visit Catherine Living Lab's website, um, there is some description about some of this work. And if you're particularly interested about our work after the earthquake, there is a block section. And we did a situation report every day for about a month after the earthquake. All these reports are available in our website. So you basically know every day what Catherine Living Lab's actually did on the ground. Um, that's my first suggestion. And the second one, for new mappers, you know, for those who are, you know, joining the community. This is what, what, what we advise in Nepal, just map it. You know, do it first, make your hands dirty. Without mapping, you won't learn, you know, you won't feel it, you know. Listening, good, you know, reading, good, but you actually need to do it. So map it, once you begin to map, you know, you feel engaged, you learn, you know, you feel immersed, that's, that's our first advice. Um, second one is, um, you know, don't think you're just mapping. That's, I think that's a problem. We need to shift our thinking from, you know, or we have to reorient from mapping to something else. We're not just mapping. Sometimes what I feel, think is mapping, the map is uh, dry, you know, unless you, are, you come from a mapping background, right? Um, you're not just mapping. You're making a community visible, right? You're putting a community on map making invisible communities visible, you know, articulating certain problems, right? And at the same time, you are also learning. For example, uh, in a lot of remote mappers, university students that are mapping from outside, they're not, contribute, they're not just contributing, they're not just mapping, they're exploring the world, you know? Somebody from Washington DC, if that person is mapping Manila, you know, you're actually exploring Manila, you learn a lot about Manila, you know? So you're expanding your knowledge, your worldview about, you know, about things. So the mapping for me happens to be narrower than, you know, what it really is. So, uh, um, you know, there is learning, there is a contribution. You also develop your skill to work with other people. There's an amazing OSM community, right? And the, particularly the young people, you need to develop your skill to work with other people from all over the world. 
where SEM is a perfect platform. You have a question, you ask question. You know, for the, if you have never done that, first time you feel a little uneasy, you know, how to frame a question. But where SEM will, you know, give you opportunity to sharpen all those skills. So, um, but at the bottom is you have to do it, <coughs> map it. Begin it from today. So uh, that's my advice to you know, newcomers. Uh, we've got a question from the back. Nico, Nita Salikod. Thank you. I wanted to pick up on, um, should I stand up? Stand I wanted up. to pick up on something that Nama said uh, in your learnings. Um, the point number one about investment beforehand, um, which I interpret to mean does data preparedness uh, tied into actual preparedness activities. Um, and I'm, this is often, I think, what's described as the hardest dollars to encourage. Uh, preparedness is uh, especially relative to the money that's uh, spent on disaster relief uh, is, is very challenging to raise. And I'm wondering if you could, either both of you, explain sort of what's been successful for you in encouraging that kind of preparedness or that kind of investment beforehand. Well, uh, that's so like, that's yeah. So, uh, thank you, uh, Andrew. Uh, so, um, look, look at this. I, again, I, I bring the example of Nepal. Uh, before earthquake, um, the funding agencies, I mean in Nepal, and also government, they really didn't understand the value of all these things, frankly speaking. Um, it takes time. Uh, where SM movement just came to Nepal just a few years ago. Um, but now they are realizing, right? I had a conversation with the Department of Survey, the Director General after the earthquake, and they said this in a meeting. In fact, you know, OpenStreetMap happened to be very useful in this crisis. This is what the Department of Survey says. And if that is the case, um, you know, we have to make investment, we have to prepare a map before you're hit by any disaster. Um, and um, um, you know, there are a whole lot of reasons why I see we should make investment. Um, so we have a project in Pokhara in city, a city of Pokhara. We're trying to create map to prepare Pokhara for disaster. But the same piece of map data is also useful in variety of other activities. So we are trying to convince the local government, look, you know, once you do have a very detailed map of the city, you are prepared not only for disaster. You can use that information as an infrastructure, information infrastructure, to provide better governing, gov you know, governance service. Right? City governments are always looking for good maps, and they don't have resource to produce that map. So uh, I think there are good reasons, uh, you know, that you know that motivates us to to invest. Um, uh, particularly in the case of Nepal, um, uh, I think there is some shift in mindset now. People are thinking, oh yeah, looks like it's useful. Uh, because I don't know whether that will re remain after a few years, but now it's still fresh from the 2015 earthquake. Um, so, um, the, uh, but, but still I haven't seen lots of you know, investment, the funding agencies, uh, you know, coming and saying, hey, you know, let's do, let's map whole Nepal, or let's map at least those, you know, 10 cities. Uh, I haven't seen that, but I can sense there is some change in the way, you know, there is funding agencies or government are, are thinking. Um, but I think we have, to, we have to make this argument collectively. We have to help people understand, you know, why investment. Uh, you know, there are already investment in disaster preparedness, in a huge amount of investment. But there is a very tiny, almost nil, in the information preparedness, data preparedness. Uh, I think that's that's a collective challenge, you know, right? So if you if you build a safer school, you know, safer health facility, yeah, you get money. But if you say we need to prepare map or data, oh, you know, uh, that's still a challenge. So we have to make an argument that uh, a good map, a good data is as important as 
uh, the physical infrastructure. The data infrastructure is as important as physical infrastructure. So that's a hard argument to make, uh, you know, that's challenging, but that's what we learn. More questions? Any other questions? Okay, so... Um, this one. Oh, we, great, we've got one in the back there from one of our fellows, actually. Actually, I don't have a question, but I wish to add something uh, for the question. Here in the Philippines, the culture here is different. Uh, the first time I had uh, an experience regarding disaster is when I was a teenager. I, we need to go uh, beyond a uh, road with a flood, breast deep high, then we're just uh, walking with rope to go to a house and give food for them. So the difference here in the Philippines, uh, resiliency is a factor. And also, it can be a big risk. And it's also a good thing that we are resilient. And what, what's good with that is even if they don't want to go out of their houses, they manage what they have, what's inside their houses. And they've been trying to do something for their family. However, the difference here is uh, some of the houses are really in the risk, risky areas. And even these people, they are used of having these floods. So uh, that's a big reality and a big problem. So that's, that's what I want to add. Yeah, just uh, since, since she mentioned uh, already about the culture of the Philippines. But I, I, I guess it's universal that uh, we need to understand the culture and the mindset of uh, people, not just Filipinos, when we deal with uh, hazards impacts and disasters. Because it's not really just science and technology that will help us in addressing hazard impacts. We must understand the mindset of uh, people, uh, the way they move, the way they respond and act to warnings. We have to understand the psychology of people. In order to understand that, we need to hire psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, because no amount of science and technology will work if the people don't embrace it. We have a question in the back from Ben. My name is Ben Smilowitz. I'm with the nonprofit Disaster Accountability Project. Um, so we're an independent watchdog in the field, and I hear a lot about the different actors and stakeholders in this conversation, but I've not really heard a whole lot about the, any criticism of the INGOs or the international organizations that are involved, and, and in the Philippines especially, and Nepal, they play a major role, but there's a lot of criticism of them for um, either raising money when they shouldn't be, or misleading on their solicitations, or not releasing funds to local organizations, or moving the money so many times that a lot of money's lost in the process and never end, ends up reaching uh, recipients. Um, not sharing their own data. And I'm wondering, you know, one of the reasons might be because they're funding a lot of the groups and people here. And that's maybe one of the reasons why people don't criticize. And I mean, American Red Cross is one of the sponsors here today. And they're one of the most um, controversial and lack of transparent organizations, you know, in the US. Um, and if you haven't looked into that, the ProPublica investigation is really something good to read up on. But I'm wondering if we can add them to the conversation and, and discuss um, challenges and opportunities in improving transparency and data sharing from the large, uh, the large organization slash industry of, of aid. What is the question? In, in one sentence, what was the question? Um, Can we just add them to the conversation and, and talk more about the challenges and opportunities in, in getting more data and information? from the larger organizations and you know, the top 10, let's say. From the larger or I, from I NGOs. Uh, from, okay. International I NGOs. Uh, so Save the Children, Care, uh, okay. Oxfam, World Vision, 
Red Crosses, World, Catholic Relief Services, um, whoever's sponsoring a lot of the organizations here. Yeah, I can yeah. Uh, you, you like to go ahead? Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, th I think that's, that's a great suggestion, you know. Um, so, um, if that is what happened, uh, you know, if that is what happens after the disaster, meaning it's not just local organizations, it's also major international organizations, government, um, citizen groups, they all work together. If that is the case, then we should, your suggestions to engage them in, in this sort of conversation is, is great, and I think that would be absolutely important to advance the conversation. Uh, yeah, that's, I think, I think that's a great, great suggestion.